Well, good morning. My name is Brittany and welcome to CASAS. We're so glad you're here with us today. If you look in the handout you received when you walked in, you should find a communication card. If this is your first or second time here with us, we would love for you to fill out that card and drop it in the offering plate at the end of the service. There's also a place on the back for prayer requests. Today, after the service, we will be having a 10-minute party in the worship center behind the stage. Some of our pastors and worship team will be back there after every service, and they would love to welcome you or answer any questions you may have. collected 1,400 pairs of shoes for children in the Marana School District. That's a lot of shoes. As a church, you almost doubled our goal. Think about how many kids' lives you change just by purchasing one pair of shoes. They're able to go to school, play sports, and just be normal kids. Well, this holiday season, we are going to do another shoe drive, and we think we can get even more shoes for all the kids that need them. So on December 2nd through December 16th, bring in any size of kids' shoes and we'll make sure a child gets them. Make sure the shoes are brand new and still in the box. Let's make this a special Christmas for the children in our community. If you missed last week's sermon, you can always find it online. You can listen and subscribe to podcasts on iTunes, watch them straight from the CASAS app, or find links on our website at casaschurch.org. There is also a place on our site where you can give to our global outreach or to this church directly. Well, we're about to get started with worship today. We're going to sing for about 20 minutes, and we would love for you to join us and sing it out. We hope you have a great morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Well, let's go ahead and stand together. I just wanted to encourage you this morning. Uh, the Advent season is the time of year for us to recognize Emmanuel, which is God with us. The God from the beginning of time and before knew that Christmas Day would happen, that he would send Christ, his son, as the hope of the world, as our salvation and our mediator in heaven for all eternity. So it's a great time of year for us to praise our God and give thanks and remember all that he's done. Let's turn to each other as we're getting started. Give each other a nice, warm, casas welcome.
let's all sing together. Your voice it thunders, the oak start twisting, the forest sounds with cedars breaking. The water see you and start their writing. Song is rising. chapter 4 where Jesus is about to teach and it says and he stood up to read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him unrolling it he found the place where it is written the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing.
Thank you for your ultimate gift in Jesus. Father, what a heart you have to sacrifice everything for us.
And Lord, today we praise your holy name. Humble ourselves before you and we lift you on high. We praise you in Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. And at this time, we have a really exciting, exciting moment where we get to take part in an entire family making that decision to be baptized together, that, that decision to say that Christ is their Lord and their Savior. So would you turn your attention to the baptistry? Good morning, Casas. My name is Kevin Phillips. I'm one of the pastors here working in Kid City. And today I have the incredible pleasure of introducing the Thornton family to all of you. This is Carson, Glenn, Allie, and Bly. They have an amazing story that all started with Carson here. I was asking him kind of how this all came about, and Carson told me that he went to his mom and he said, Mom, I just I really want to get baptized. I want to, you know, you know, go in front of the church and let everybody know that I, I'm following Jesus and I want to get baptized. And like all moms, okay, let's wait, see if this is something you're really serious about. And Carson said he kept going, and, and Bly said he just was very persistent. And I'm hearing this story thinking, what faith does it take for a, you know, a young boy to want to go up in front of a thousand people and get wet and get dunked? And uh, it was just, to me, it was such a statement of God moving in this family. And so Carson pursuing this so much uh, moved the whole family. And they all started asking questions about their faith and where they're at with God. And they ended up deciding, you know what, if God has moved in Carson this way, how beautiful would it be if they all got baptized? And so we're here today. They're here celebrating as a family and, and saying to all of you, they've made a decision to follow Jesus and they want to be a part of our church. And it all started with Carson here. Yeah. High five, dude. So Carson, look around at this church. Look at all the people, all of you. Look around. This is your new church family, your brothers and sisters in Christ. All of these people are here to help you and help all of you as a family become the very best you can be. Carson, have you made a decision that you want to follow Jesus the rest of your life? Yes. And do you know that now God is with you no matter what, whether you're good or bad, God will never leave you and he'll never give up on you? Yes. Then in remembrance of God's love, in remembrance of the forgiveness offered by Christ, and in remembrance of the presence of the Holy Spirit, I baptize you. You understand that God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for the man he wants you to be. Do you submit to that plan and pursue God? Yes. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Holy Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay. Allie, do you understand that God has a plan for you? He has a plan for the woman he wants you to grow up to be and a beautiful vision. Do you understand that following Jesus is the best way you can live your life? and commit to do that before this church? Yes. And I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Why, do you understand now, God has forgiven all your sins, that before Him you are clean and blameless? Do you receive that gift from God today? Yes. And I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. not one of the coolest things ever? It's just, that's awesome. Friends, we are so glad to have you here, and if you're a guest with us, uh, that's kind of what we're about. Not necessarily, you don't have to go in the water yet, but just that we want to help real people uh, find a real, genuine, authentic relationship with Jesus, and because we believe Jesus changes everything. 
And uh, that's kind of what we're about. And if you're a guest with us today, it is a real honor to have you here. And you're going to be blessed here in just a few moments as we kind of lean into a song together as Glenn comes to share our second week of this Advent Conspiracy. And, and just uh, you're going to be really, really blessed. And so a couple things for you. If you are kind of new to Casas, kind of new in the orbit of being around us a little bit, in your handout, there's a communication card. We would love uh, to get a copy of this from you. We won't hound you, I promise, but just a chance to say, hey, how can we connect and help you take next steps? And so maybe in a moment you want to fill this out. If you don't get it turned in the offering, uh, you can actually bring it to the 10-minute party we're having right at the end of the service or hand it to one of our guest service folks on the way out. And as we continue in worship, uh, I'm going to just ask our ushers to get in place. I'm going to say a prayer for that, and I have a couple other quick things to share with you on the following side of that prayer. So let's pray as our ushers get in place. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to see real life change. God, that is what this church is about. That's what your church is about, meeting real people in real ways to see life change happen. And we ask that we would be a place and a group of people that would see that happen times and just thousands of times over in the years ahead. Father, use these gifts now that the story of Jesus would meet the story of each and every person here in this city. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we're taking up our offering, thank you again to all of you who partner with us in that. We're really honored to have you. None of this happens without you in that. Now, a couple of things to let you know about. Uh, kicks for kids. How many have been bringing in shoes for that? We've got our box truck out here on the plaza, and we'll have that next week is the last week to bring that in. So as you're out shopping this week, uh, maybe kind of look for, remember this is athletic shoes in the original box from children all the way to adult sizes. This is Blessing Miranda Unified School District and some Title I schools that we partnered with last year, partnering with them again. And uh, it's a real blessing to those kids and to those families. And so make that a point uh, to join us in that. Also today on the Plaza Financial Peace University, we're doing that again in January. Really, really helpful. Uh, and today's the last day you can sign up in December. You can always sign up online. And we'll start up again in January, taking registrations as we get that started near the end of January. All the information's online. You can find out for that as well as our Christmas Eve services. Very excited about the opportunity we've got. Services at 1, 3, 5, and 7. So four services. Uh, we want you to see this as a great opportunity. In fact, last week in your handout, you were given a, a little insert that you could hand out to people and invite them. Next week, you'll have that in there. Today, you can grab one of these cards in the foyer, just Christmas at Casas. Use it in a conversation with maybe a coworker or a friend or a family member. Say, hey, come with us. Now, to make that happen, we need a lot of volunteers. That's where you all come in. We have four services with tons of different opportunities for you to connect with. So here's how you can do that, how you can help. You can go online, casaschurch.org, click on the big button, the big picture frame there that says Christmas at Casas. Once you click that, it'll take you to an area that where you can register and volunteer. And there's several different places that are drop downs where you can say, hey, I'd like to do that. Maybe I'll help in the parking lot. I'll be an usher. I'll be a greeter. I'll work with, out and I'll carol. Maybe you can sing really well. If you can't sing really well, then don't sign up for caroling, okay? It's okay. Um, there's other places for you to sign up. So be a part of that. Now, if you are going to volunteer with us in Christmas Eve, we do have child care for you. You may be a volunteer around here, and we thank you, and you make a huge difference. But if you're not volunteering that night, we do not have child care for you. We love you. We still love you. Um, but if you're helping us out, we'll, fact, we'll feed you. We'll take care of all that stuff. So just check that out online and make this a point to invite someone with you. Uh, we want to serve this up in a way to help thousands of people that will be here Christmas Eve and your friend that might be on your shoulder with you. So be praying for that. God's going to be active in doing that, doing some great things. Now, as we continue, uh, I just I pray that this next song just kind of wash over you in a way that kind of stirs us towards we move toward Christmas, and it just blesses you. We're really glad that you're here today.
series called Advent Conspiracy, where uh, it's all about uh, reminding us and helping us to conspire to something deeper this Christmas season, not get lost in all of the things that maybe uh, take us away from that. And of course, we, we live in a culture that can do that, right? And it's not necessarily bad things, but we live in a culture that can uh, pull us away. I have a great example of this one, and this one maybe is a, a, a bad thing. Uh, one of our uh, one of our staffers uh, gave this to me Thursday, and this is an email she received from a, a credit company uh, trying to get her to do something with her credit card or something like that. But in the subject line, it says, this uh, real email that came to her this week. In the subject line, it says, spend more this holiday season with your higher credit rating. Your holiday credit rating increased December 5th. Um, and then it goes on, it says, uh, this holiday season, you will now be able to spend much more than previous years without any limitations. <laughs> it's just like, come, get in debt. You can have more debt this Christmas season than ever before, because, you know, your credit rating's gone up. So now you have more, you know, space to wreck it to get down to, you know, in a thing. Um, but we live, right, we live in a, um, in a culture that has so many things that want to uh, pull at us during this uh, season that we can lose that. We can lose the real meaning of the season. So what I want to talk about here this morning is 
about keeping Christmas simple and focused on what Christmas is really all about because there's this kind of truth with Christmas as there is with many things that sometimes uh, lots of obligations and things to do and complexity even with good things can choke out greater things. And so sometimes uh, we can lose the beauty of Christmas if we get so involved with so many different things, especially obligations and things that we think we ought to do and how we need to handle things and and, and the complexity of all the things that can happen. Uh, we it, it just gets suffocated out. So let's talk this morning about how not to let... Uh, the real meaning of Christmas and the beauty of what can happen in us because of that get suffocated out. And to get at this, um, I want you to think about the world that Jesus was born into. Uh, it was an incredible culture, but also it's important to understand that the Jewish culture that Christ was born into was at its at the height of complexity and uh, involvement. It was at the height of of this kind of commitment to live out the spiritual life. There was so much devotion to that. And yet one of the things that we see in that, that, that at times it was kind of lost. The deeper meaning could be lost in that. That's one of the things that Jesus pointed to. And so I wanna, I wanna walk through just a little bit of history here because this will pertain to uh, the rest of the message here, but I wanna go through a little bit of history of how the Jewish culture got to where it was and why it was what it was in Christ's day. And I want you to think about this. God could have sent Christ at any moment in history why did he pick this point in history when it was really at the apex of duty and devotion to following God in every way possible? And God picked that moment in history to do that. And, I, and it says some things about God. So uh, a little understanding of how the culture got to where it was. And a lot of this starts all the way back in 586 BC. Something very dramatic happened uh, then. And it was the, not just the fall of Jerusalem, but it was the destruction of the temple. And prior to this uh, time in the Jewish culture, the temple was at the center of Jewish culture and Jewish life. So much of what held them together started with the tabernacle and then with the temple. Life circled around what happened with that. And in 586, Nebuchadnezzar uh, from Babylon comes in. He had already it was exerting an immense amount of control on Jerusalem. Gets frustrated with the leaders as the Jewish leaders start to push back. Comes in. He sacks the city of Jerusalem and destroys the temple. And all of a sudden you have a Jewish culture now that has lost this kind of center that they had to their culture. And they actually go for quite some time with no temple at all. Uh, they've been hauled off into captivity and it could have been a time when the Jews lost that sense of who they were, lost that sense of the covenant relationship that they had with God. Uh, later on, uh, Darius the Great comes and allows them to begin rebuilding the temple. He actually puts money towards this, rebuilds the temple, but it's a smaller temple. Later, in the uh, be right before Christ comes on the scene, Herod the Great rebuilds the temple in spectacular splendor. But starting with Darius all the way through Herod the Great, and then in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the temple again, and it's never been rebuilt. Um, the temple, even though they had it, was still in many ways under the control of foreigners. And they allowed the building and the rebuilding and the use of it to occur, but they did that for their own means. It was a way to control the Jews. It was a way uh, to protect their own interests. And so you have the Jews during, this, during centuries here where they've lost the center of what they had. How do they keep from losing their culture, their identity, this sense of being the people of God? Well, an interesting thing happened after the fall of the first temple. 
is that wherever they were, oftentimes they would, there would be a, a house and they would take this house and they formed this kind of assembly in this house where they would be devoted to the teaching of the Torah and how to live it out. And as time progressed, uh, in every village, every town, they would have this place, this central place that was all about cultivating this covenant relationship that they had with God. And uh, so they used the Jewish word for assembly there. Anyone know what it is? We still have it today. Synagogue, a synagogue. And that's kind of how the synagogue uh, was birthed. And it kind of held, it became the new center of of the Jewish culture. And with that came the rise of a new role. With the temple, you had this priestly role that was a part of all of this. But with the temple gone and its role changed, and they brought priests back, but there was a new role that was associated with the synagogue that became vitally important uh, to this sense of, of Jewish community. community. Anyone know what that role is? Still have it today? Yeah, the rabbi, the rabbi. And the rabbi's job was primarily to teach the Torah and interpret what it meant in a very practical way, to actually begin giving tangible explanations for what they called how to live Torah. And so they would build upon um, these ways of, okay, here's what the Torah says, first five books of the Bible, and how do you live that out? And they would begin giving explanations of this. And over time, over centuries, there would be rabbis that would become very influential, very insightful. And their work was then used to, uh, and built upon by other rabbis, and they would memorize everything these rabbis would teach. And over the centuries, it became this vast volume of oral tradition, of essentially commentary and interpretation of what all of these rabbis had taught until by the time you get to Christ's day, um, the, the volumes of material uh, completely were uh, much larger in volume than the Torah itself. All these rabbis, about 200 AD, they finally wrote down this oral tradition. Uh, and, it's, and today it's called the Mishnah. Um, but the Mishnah had all of these interpretations about how to live life. And each rabbi would have a set of regulations, a set of rules, a set of how to live Torah and it was called a yoke. And so every rabbi had what was called a yoke, how to live it out. Let me give you an example of this. Um, if you look in your Bibles in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 6, I'll give you just one example of, of this famous, famous passage out of the Torah. It says this, and this follows what's called the Shema. Uh, and it says this, these commands uh, that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. So that's the Torah. So a rabbi would, would say, here's the Torah, but now you've got to interpret how you live that out. So when it says, uh, I want you to uh, talk about this with them. Well, how much talk qualifies to living out the Torah? Like if you talk about it like five words, is that enough to say we live Torah today because we talked about, you know, we used five words to describe how this would be? Or uh, do you, is it a matter of time? Do you have to talk about it for like 30 minutes every day? Well, rabbis would give interpretation to that. They would say, you know, here's how long you've got to talk about it. Here's how you have to talk about it. When it talks about, uh, it says there, uh, when you sit at home, when you walk, uh, when, when you lie down or when you get up. So like, when you get up, does that mean that you actually have to be doing some of this like before your head comes off the pillow? Or do you have to do it like before you eat breakfast? Or do you, and, and it sounds, you know, kind of funny, but in reality, they had such devotion to living this out. They wanted to live the Torah out to the nth degree. They wanted to get it down. They were so devoted uh, to this. And so they would form these yokes and they became these endless regulations. But here's what happened by the time you get to Christ's day. It became this insurmountable amount of obligations and rules and processes and things you had to do that the very thing that it was meant to do, give life to living the Torah, actually started to become crushing. And people uh, in Jesus' day could devote themselves to this and still never live up to it. 
And it started to suffocate them under the weight of this kind of spiritual legalism that had started to form these heavy, heavy yokes that people were trying to live under. And in a weird way, you can devote, your something, devote yourself to something with such great complexity to try so hard at it and yet miss it. And here's what I want to say. The same thing can happen with Christmas. In our great effort to celebrate, to enjoy, to live out Christmas, we can suffocate the deepest, most precious meaning of what Christmas is all about. Let me go back to, uh, to Deuteronomy, right? Here's this thing that, that they lived out to the nth degree, but it ended up becoming this crushing thing with all of these very precise regulations you'd have to live out. But listen to what the Shema really is uh, here. Look, uh, look at uh, verse 5, which comes right before it. Look, look what it says. And here it is. Here's the simple command that God has given, and it is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, right? And we've all heard that a thousand times. That's the Shema. Love God. And you say, how is it that you could take something so simple as just love God and turn it into this set of regulations that at the end of the day, the mass amount of effort it takes to live it out actually chokes your heart out from genuinely, simply loving God in your everyday life. Well, it's the complexity to it. It's, it's, it's the bad side of spiritual legalism, isn't it? It's, it's when we become legalistic at something, and it has this way of choking out the life of what can be uh, so good. So, uh, today, I want us to get at the heart of this idea that, uh, of not allowing Christmas to be this thing that becomes so complex that it chokes out the real meaning of uh, what's there. You know, one of the sad things that happen uh, in Jesus' day is because it was so difficult to live out these yokes that were put upon people. Oftentimes, it was a very small group of people that could live that out. And it created, uh, you know, second and third class citizens at a religious or spiritual level. And so you had a small group of people that felt like they were living this out and could kind of hold their head high. But you had a vast amount of people that for different reasons always felt like they didn't measure up. They couldn't measure up. And because of that, uh, some people would be devoted even harder. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to work at this. And they'd work and work and work and never uh, measure up, but always carried this sense of guilt because they were never able to measure up. And you see examples of that throughout the New Testament. There were lots of people, lots of Jews that looked at this and just said, you know what? I can never live up to these yokes that are out there. They're just too heavy. I'm just going to quit. I'll just, uh, maybe God won't love me, but, but maybe he'll tolerate me, right? And it was just kind of this depressing state. And through some of these interpretations, uh, they started to look at people uh, who had illnesses or uh, who suffered in some way or who were even poor. And they looked at that and they said, that must be because they're doing something wrong. They're not living up to that yoke. They're not living up to the obligations. And so when the Christmas story takes place, is at the height of all of this. And there's some things about the Christmas story that point to some beautiful things here about God's great love and that God's not after a suffocating system that ends up leaving people out. Rather, the gospel is for all Jews and all Gentiles. It's for all people. Um, uh, think about this for a moment. I want to look at uh, uh, two people here. So if we fast forward to, you know, you go through all that history and you fast forward to that very first uh, Christmas, um, I want you to think about Elizabeth, who is, was John the Baptist's uh, mother. Of course, she is well into years by now. She's had uh, no children, and that would have been seen as a kind of scourge in this culture. They would have looked at that and said, boy, you know, you must have done something wrong. There's some hidden sin in your life, or you're not measuring up. God doesn't like you very much if you can't have uh, children. It says this in Luke. If you want, flip over to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 7, it says this. It says, uh, speaking of Elizabeth and her husband, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren. And this idea of being barren, there's something wrong with her, not just physically, there's something wrong with her spiritually. And, and that would have been the point in this society. And then it goes on, and they were uh, both well along in years. There's no hope now. 
right? There's just something wrong. Um, and rabbis would, uh, some rabbis would have interpreted this in that way. And, and Elizabeth would have carried this around. But here's the beauty of the Christmas story uh, here in all of this, is that God changes that, doesn't he? Um, in fact, uh, Gabriel comes and talks with Elizabeth's uh, husband. And then it says this down in verse 24. It says, after this, uh, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. Uh, the Lord has, and, and she's speaking, verse 25, the Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor, and look at this, taken away my disgrace among the people. And this phrase, taken away my disgrace, that's, that's the grace of God. That's, the, right, that's part of the purpose of, of Christmas is that God has come and through his redemption, our, any disgrace we have is taken away. We now live in grace. And the person who maybe wouldn't have measured up, part of the message of Christmas is she does. In the grace of Christ, she measures up. This isn't what God desires here. Isn't just for a small group of people that can measure up to this very difficult religious system. This is, this is for everybody. And that's part of the picture of Christmas. And maybe you've come here this morning and maybe you're thinking about this and you're saying, you know, man, I'm coming to church, but you know, we'll be lucky if the, if the, you know, if the, if the ceiling doesn't cave in because I'm in here. So, you know, I hear that all the time. But you know, the truth is church should be a place for all people. It should be a place for doubters. It should be a place for seekers. It should be a, a place for people who uh, have failed in life. It should be a place for successful. It should be because Jesus came for all people. And that's the beauty of this. You've, you've never failed in such a way that you're now uh, beyond repair in God's eyes. This is for all people. Uh, one more example of this at the heart of the Christmas story is Mary. You think about Mary for a moment. Um, she is a poor Jewish peasant girl in a poor little village. And no one would have thought that if God was going to do something dramatic in this world, that, he, it, that it would break through with a poor peasant little girl like Mary in a remote village, you know? And yet God is saying that is precisely why I did it. Because I use people that this world might think are nobodies. And I love to use them because they matter to me. Everyone matters to God. And sometimes we lose that beauty in the gospel message that when Jesus came to this world, he came for everybody. See, that's at the heart and soul of it. And sometimes the complexity of a religious system, whether it be Judaism or whether it be Christianity, can begin to crowd that out in all the things. We can begin to crowd that out in good things, wonderful things that we do throughout the Christmas uh, season. But that's never the intent. In fact, here's what Jesus uh, um, said. There's this great passage um, uh, found in Matthew 11. If you want to flip to uh, Matthew 11 here, I love, I love what Jesus says uh, about this. So he has started his, his ministry now. Remember what he says in Matthew 11, verse 29, he says this. He says, take my yoke, right? And so what's a yoke? That would have been, he's a rabbi. He, remember, remember, Jesus is a Jewish rabbi and he would have had a yoke. He would have said, this is how you live out Torah, right? Here's how you live this out. All the gospel message is Jesus explaining how to live out life, how to be a follower of God in this covenant love relationship with God. And here's what he says about his yoke, right? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle. Right, this whole idea, I'm not gonna beat you up. My yoke is not about pounding you into oblivion. My yoke is not about testing to see, you know, uh, how much you can endure, what you can take. He says, because, uh, it, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And that was so Jesus. It was this simple love and desire he had to reach uh, people. And he says, and you will find rest for your weary souls. Now think about this for a moment. All of these yokes out there, a tradition of all of these yokes, heavy yokes, yokes, difficult yokes. 
And Jesus sees how weary people have been trying to please God on religious treadmills that in the end never get them any closer to God. It leaves them weary and tired. He watched people trying to please God uh, through this religious system and it didn't work and it left them as quitters. It left them filled uh, with guilt that they couldn't get rid of. And the people that thought that they lived up with it, uh, lived up to it, it left them feeling prideful and arrogant and lording it over other people. And Jesus looked at this and said, no, this ultimately isn't what the Torah was all about. The Torah is about life with God. And he says, when you take on my yoke, it'll be easy. It'll be life-giving. And so he says, you take on my yoke because all you who are weary, this is what you need. Isn't that See, that's Christmas. Christmas is that God came to offer that yoke. That's the beauty of Christmas. It's not to be a time of the year that wears us out and leaves us, you know, January 1 with our tongues hanging out, uh, having missed what the whole season was about. Uh, Later on in verse 30, Jesus says this, famous, famous words, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that's why Christmas is such an amazing time of the year. That's why when people get worn out and beat up by this life and feel like God is far away, the simple Christmas story is a story of the greatest hope and truth that God, who was called Emmanuel, really did come and be among us and offer us redemption in life with him. And we need to bask and enjoy that in this simple season of that simple truth. So let me switch gears here for just a few moments. And because I'm going to challenge you about all that I've talked about here to live this out in a, in a real way. And part of this gets to just don't let Christmas become so complex and burdensome that it wears you out and keeps you from enjoying the profound simplicity of what Christmas is all about. So let me, let me challenge all of us, including me, on some very simple uh, things uh, here about, about Christmas. Uh, the first one is this. Uh, take the pressure off this Christmas season. Um, be aware of those things in your life that feel like obligations because I promise you if you're anything like me you come into the Christmas season with a sense of all the obligations of all the things that you need to live up to and there's a lot of them in our culture start with time Uh, when it comes to your time you know it it seems like the Christmas season is when things get busy and crazy and there's more places you need to be and this is you know I got to get together with the family over here and I got to get the family over here and my friends are doing this and of course there's the work party and I don't dare miss that thing and I got this going on. And it's just, and can I just say, you don't have to go to all those things. You don't have to do that. It's okay to, you know, tell Aunt Betty, not this year, okay? <laughs> I love you, but I won't miss you, okay? Because I'm, you know, I, it wears me out and we do that whole big family thing and I'm an introvert and it's just, and it's a bunch of small talk and it just wears me out and I can't do that anymore, okay? It's okay to say no to things. It's okay to say, you know what? I want to spend some time with family and I want to spend some time with friends, but I don't have to spend time with all my family and all my friends. I can pick and choose and that's okay. And you know, sometimes that's hard to do because, right, all the obligations. Well, if I don't go to that, they'll be upset because they found out I went to this thing over there and just, and it's, you know what? Jesus doesn't expect you to do all that. And you can say uh, no to some of those things. Uh, When it comes to spending, right? Sometimes when it comes to spending, we feel all these obligations. We feel, oh, you know, I gotta gotta spend all this money because I gotta do all this kind of decorating and we're gonna have all of these meals and I, you know, there's, you know, I gotta buy the stuff for this and take it over to that thing. Well, you know, if you go to less places, you'll have to take less food. You can spend less money on all that crazy food that you're gonna, you know, have to uh, make. And, uh, and oftentimes it's this time of year that, that we all, right, are tempted to spend in ways that we don't really want to. And we feel obligated to sometimes like, well, you know, so-and-so spent this much money on me last year and I only spent that much. And so I've got to spend, you know, at least that much this year. And, you know, don't worry about it. They probably felt like you're a cheatskate last year. And so they're not going to spend anything on you this year. So don't, you know, don't worry about it. Just take the obligation off. Don't, don't. Don't put yourself in a financial position where you come into January 
and you've racked up credit card debt and you've spent money that you didn't want to, you shouldn't have spent. And now you're living with all this financial stress. And you know what? Financial stress, that'll steal the real meaning of Christmas from you. That, that'll weigh you down. And yet as Americans, we do this so often and, and you don't have to. Maybe make a Christmas budget this year. If you know that's you, and you always hate January because of what you spend in December, make a Christmas budget and just say, this is, I'm not going to go past this because I know if I do, it will, it will suffocate the greater beauty of me getting the most out of what Christmas is really all about. You'll recall uh, we did our All In series a month or so ago. And remember, we had the six financial uh, principles about faith and finances. And uh, we did this challenge to live by those six principles over the next 12 months. And you remember, we all signed those cards and you know, made our commitments and what we were going to do. And you turned all of those into us. And I promised that we would mail them back to you this time of year when we're all tempted to, you know, to blow off those six principles for the sake of Christmas. Well, guess what? The cards are in the mail. Okay. <laughs> They've been mailed. You'll, you'll probably get them uh, in the next uh, day or so. So you know what? When you get that card in the mail, pull it out. And that's your commitment, not to us, not to any, that's your commitment to you. A decision you made that wasn't in the, in the hustle and bustle of the Christmas season and, and stay committed to that. Say, I'm going, I'm going to handle my money in a way that makes sense. And if you do that, it takes that pressure and that strain off. And I promise you, you'll be able to enjoy Christmas more. Christmas isn't the time of year to, to live under countless obligations about your time and your money. It's a time of year to enjoy those around you and to reflect on the beauty of God's incredible love for you. Don't let other things uh, crowd that out. You know, if you want to get a, uh, if you want to give a, a really nice gift, you know, one gift you could give, especially if it's to like a younger person, like a young adult, give them the gift of a scholarship to FPU, to, to Financial Peace University. You know, they don't need another electronic thing. I know they're saying they do, but they really don't. Give them, give them a scholarship to Financial Peace University. That is a gift. You know, the old cliche, the gift that keeps on giving. That's a gift that will keep on giving. Find something creative. And maybe it's something that doesn't even cost a lot. Maybe it's something you make. Um, but don't live under the obligations of the Christmas season because it will suffocate you out uh, as, as much as any religious obligations can, can snuff out that life-giving relationship that we have with Christ. So uh, uh, do some things to simplify your Christmas. And you can go online on our website. We've got some real practical things. Remember the button I talked about uh, last week? Every week through this series, we've got some things that you can do with your family or just you in a very practical uh, way. If you just go to the website and click on the logo for the Advent Conspiracy thing, and it'll take you there. Now, I'm going to end here just a little bit early because there, uh, there's something else I want to tell you about. But before I do that, uh, let me just say a quick prayer to uh, wrap up uh, the sermon here. And then I want to share something else with you that's uh, real exciting here. So let me, let me just pray here. Father, we just, we just thank you for this Christmas season. And we pray that this Christmas season, it be a season that we get to reflect on just how profound your love is for human beings, how deep your love is for us, the beauty, the beauty of a story about the God from the Old Testament sending his son to this world to offer forgiveness for all humanity. Don't let us miss the beauty of Emmanuel. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, there's something I want to tell you about. I wanted to kind of talk to you about this uh, sooner, but we haven't had all the details worked out on it. And I think we've got enough details worked out that we can share this with you. Um, probably a couple of months ago, uh, Jack and I had lunch together and Jack shared a few things with me. Where's Jack? You can come up here for this. Um, he, uh, he shared with me an opportunity that he saw here in Tucson uh, that involves him in a, in a huge uh, way and asked me to begin praying about this. Uh, and it involves another church here in town, Pantano Christian Church mm -hmm. on the other side of town. 
fantastic, fantastic church over on the other side of town that we've worked for with for a long time. Mm-hmm. And a Pantano has a small, uh, they have a, a small congregation that has its own service. And the affinity with this congregation is that they actually, a couple of years ago, right. pulled together to actually launch a church into Midtown because Midtown is a place that needs a dynamic, uh, powerful church uh, in there. And they have wanted to do that, but they've not, uh, and they've got all the staff they need except, <laughs> except a really good dynamic preacher and point leader on, on this thing. And they actually talked with you, uh, and you've worked with Brian, who was right. kind of leading that thing a couple yeah. years ago, and uh, Jack felt like God just wasn't in that. But uh, here recently came to me and you were just kind of really praying about it, feeling like you needed to Mm -hmm. ask me to pray about it. And when he did, I was just like, okay, I'll pray about it. But I already know the answer. I just, (laughs) that moment, I was just, uh, and as much as I hate to lose you on staff here, in that moment, I just knew that, that God was in this, that God was doing this and that you really are the right man to lead that and, and to make that happen. Not long after that, I talked with Glenn Elliott, who is the uh, senior, the equivalent of the senior pastor over at Pantano. Mm-hmm. And he and I talked about it and just, you know, our, our mission is very similar to Pantano's and it's, it's this idea of leading spiritually disconnected people into that life-giving relationship with God. And Glenn kind of uh, dreamed with me a a little bit and just said, what would it be like, right, if two churches like Pantano and Casas partnered together to really launch another church into a part of Tucson that needs it so much and how two churches like Pantano and Casas could come together to, that would just be good for the kingdom of God, working together in that way that we can do some things to really leverage the effectiveness of uh, all of this. And so I, while I hate to lose Jack, uh, I'm so excited about the role that Pantano, Casas, and that you're going to have in doing some of this. So why don't you talk just about the, the vision and what's happening with you bet. Well, uh, with Brian, and there's a video you're going to see next week that will fill in some pieces here that we shot this week. And, and I've known Brian in 15 years. This really in a lot of ways, goes back to something that Tim Coop, who was the lead pastor at Pantano and Roger Barrier, began 15 plus years ago in developing young pastors and pouring into them here in the city. And, and to see the, the overflow of that coming from this is incredible. Uh, it's just honoring to be part of that journey. Uh, and that maybe I'd sum it up this way. Um, a home church has incredible power to it. A home church has power to it. And power to impact lives and to bring people along in their spiritual formations, to help people take next steps, to be in the low times and the high times of life, and to help them be centered to the kind of life uh, that Jesus invites us to. You know, and you all have been that for me. You have been that for my family. You know, my family moved here in the mid 70s. We started coming to Casas, and I, I, I took next steps with Jesus here. I got baptized here. I met my wife here. I got married here. All three of my kids have been born here. In two weeks, I will have baptized my third child. All three of my kids will be baptized here. This is a home church that's had incredible power into my life, into my family's life, that, you know, I've stood on this stage and conducted the funeral service for my mom. You know, in low moments and in high moments, uh, you all have been a part of that journey with me and with my family, and it just... That kind of relationship, that kind of home church power uh, is desperately needed in Midtown. I, I just, I heard another church, even this last service, that's, that's leaving Midtown and going to the suburbs. And, and I've, I just got a passion for this city. I believe in this city. I believe in what God wants to do here. And uh, friends, you, there's so much activity that goes on in Midtown and in this city, but there's very little life. And we want to be uh, kind of bringing the hope of Jesus to the heart of the city. In fact, there's a, a website you can look at. It's just a prayer page. It's Element City Church is the name of this church. Uh, Elements is the service that's meeting at Pantano currently. We meet Sunday nights. That's going to launch uh, into Midtown. Hopefully next year we're homeless in the sense that we have a home, but we don't have a home in Midtown. So 
I'd love your prayers for that, because that's a big deal. Um, it helps. So it does have, it helps to have a home. Uh, so maybe I, I'd sum it up in, in three things. Just one thank you. Thank you for uh, being a part of our journey, investing so much into my family, into me. Um, just thank you to you and to the leadership here at Casas and to Roger. And just, uh, I got to cut my teeth in ministry here. I got to fail and I got to get picked back up and, and just molded to become who I am. Uh, I just, I believe in you. I believe in this church and what you all have in front of you. And the partnership here is not something that's done. It's really just taking it a different step. And we'll see where that goes. I'm just very excited to be a part of that. So thank you to all of you who've been a part of investing in my family, my kids. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe the, the second thing I'd say is uh, pray for us. That, you know, elementcitychurch.org is the website. There's a prayer page there we, There's with some list of things that we need. Uh, we have a lot. We've got a great core group, but we have a long way to go uh, to be a dynamic, contemporary, uh, life-giving kind of church in the heart of our city. And we want that more than anything because uh, there's a lot of people that maybe not even realize that they need a home church and don't even realize they need a relationship with Jesus, that that is what they're searching for. Um, and it's what I was searching for, and it changed me, and it, we want to be that for them. And then thirdly, uh, join us in, in any which way that you want to be a part of that. Join us, be a part of this. is a God-sized dream. It's going to take God-sized activity, and uh, we need your prayers, and we need your support in that. And so grateful for you and for this church and for you, my family. Fantastic. So. We're excited for <clears throat> what's to come. And... Um, you know, the, the partnership that started uh, between Tim Coop and Roger, you know, 15 plus years uh, ago that has continued between Pantano and us, uh, that continues with this. I, I'm very excited about the idea that it's, it, this is not just, you know, launching Jack out there to start a church. This is extending this kind of relational dynamic within Tucson with churches and I, I'm just excited about that because I've watched what God has done with us and Pantano and some things. And, uh, you know, Jack and I go way back. I mean, we went to high school together. We took a crazy algebra class together at uh, Pima. It was, yeah, we've got lots of stories about that that we'll share another time. Um, but, uh, and we've done ministry together. Our kids, you know, that, that there's, there's these relationships that I think strength, strengthen churches in amazing ways. I, I mean, like our kids spend the night over at each other's uh, oh, homes. Was last night? Yeah. In fact, my house was very calm and quiet. It's very nice and peaceful last night because you're welcome. My good friend, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I sugar. Her up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now she's going to be, <laughs> but, but you know, good luck. that's what friends do. Uh, uh, but seriously, it, it's, this is a chance, uh, you know, I think about this, uh, 49 years ago, mm -hmm. there was a church, uh, kind of in the Midtown yep. area that looked at Tucson and said, there's not a dynamic church right now that can reach Northwest Tucson 49 years ago. And that church said, let's be a part of launching a church into a part of Tucson that needs it. And that church that got launched into Northwest Tucson was Casas, was Casas. And I think now is an opportunity for Casas and Pantano to partner together to say Midtown needs something. And for the, and for the sake of the gospel, the kingdom of God, we're going to get to be a part of doing something in a really dynamic way that's going to be ongoing. I, I think you'll see us uh, interacting as churches in the future, and uh, we believe in you, and, and just uh, great things are going to happen through all of this. So uh, we're out of time, but why, why don't you... <laughs> no, we're never over time. No, we're just, you know, yeah, uh, but why don't you close us out here? You bet. Uh, why don't you all stand with me, uh, and we'll just kind of... Pray for our city a little bit and pray for our week ahead. So let's pray. Father, we, uh, we are grateful to be part of your story. It's the biggest story. It's the greatest story. And we all get enfolded and invited into that, each and every one of us. So Father, we lift up Tucson to you. And we pray for a great renewal and awakening of your church and the power it can bring in the lives of real people that are searching for what you have already given I pray that you would awaken folks all across the city in every church that's following after your son to see you and experience you, 
and have their life changed by that. And Father, I pray for your blessing over Casas, Pantano, and your churches across Tucson. May we represent you well, point people to you, and celebrate the beauty of what you're up to in their lives. And Father, for my friends now, as we just live in the, the little clutter of Christmas, may we not miss the significance and the simplicity of the simple beauty of what Christmas is about. And it's about you with us. So we're grateful for that. Bless us this week as we go. Ask that in Jesus' name and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Go. Ten minute party happening right now, if you're new. Thank you. <laughs>